Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new session of the Permit uh, COE webinar series. Today, uh, Laurence Falson and uh, Anna Motagut are going to uh, talk about how HPC high performance computing boost uh, mathematical model promises of personalized medicine. Uh, my, my name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of MLDMI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the, the uh, question and answer section, and that the recording will be designated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. So please uh, use the Q&A button in your uh, Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. So let me uh, talk a bit about the uh, permit theory. Uh, so Permit COE is the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. Uh, Permit COE focuses on the simulation of cellular and mechanistic models, which are essential to translate all the omics data into uh, medical actions. Uh, currently, the performance of the cell simulation software is not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments for patients. So Permet COE is going to scale up the, the existing software for cell simulations to the present HPC exascale systems in order to enable the creation of models of cellular functions of medical relevance. Permet COE will achieve this goal through a series of objectives. First, it's going to optimize a selected uh, software to run in the pre-exascale platforms. Second, Permet COE is developing a series of use cases that will showcase the applications of the project of the products in different fields of clinical interest, such as the drug synergies for cancer treatments or performing multi-scale modeling of COVID-19 virus and patient's tissue. Additionally, Permed COE also has ob as objectives training the biomedical professions in the use of the HPC Permed tools, integrating the personalized medicine communities into the European HPC ecosystem, and building the basis for the sustainability of permit COE. So today our speakers are going to uh, tell us about uh, some of those permit uh, COE use cases. So let me now introduce our speakers. Uh, Dr. Lorenz Calzon has published uh, mathematical models using uh, several formalisms, including nonlinear ordinary differential equations and Boolean formalism to address specific biological questions related to, to cancer with the aim to provide personalized treatments. She participates in developing uh, methods and tools to improve the simulations of the mathematical model she builds. She's an active member of modeling communities such as Colomoto and Sismo. And now Dr. Arnaud Montagut completed his studies in cell biology at the University of Valencia. Uh, as an undergraduate, Arnaud participated in the synthetic biology IGM competition uh, where he dove into the use of models in biology. He has worked at different institutions as part of his research on metabolic engineering of hydrogen in cyanobacteria. He has also applied modeling techniques to cancer using, lo using logical models agent-based models, and data deconvolution and integration. Uh, so, Laurence, and now, thank you very much for being here today, and the floor is yours. Okay, can you confirm that you see everything? Yeah. Correctly. Okay. So I am. Uh, I'm very happy uh, today to be here and uh, to have the opportunity to present some of the work we've been doing in the context of Permedco with uh, Arna Montagud, among others. It's a, it's a, a work that includes a, a lot of people, and we'll try to show you uh, pretty fast some of the results. The idea is to use uh, high uh, performance computers to boost mathematical models promises of personalized medicine. So to make some uh, simulations that were not possible before possible today. And of course, I will start from scratch. I will give you uh, some, some introductions of, uh, of our motivations and, and, and what, how we do it also. Um, so some of the goals that we had when we started the project was to understand the deregulated mechanisms uh, in diseases. 
the, the point of all this is to find and to suggest some uh, intervention points that uh, would allow to revert the disease uh, phenotypes. So it can be a, a pro a proliferation or, or, or escape from apoptosis, and we want to revert that. The idea is to use mathematical model to, to reason on, on, on things we don't understand and that, that become non-intuitive, some ex experimental results that we, we don't uh, understand just by, uh, by intuition. And of course, with this mathematical model, we, we can suggest some in vivo or in vitro experiments uh, that are based on our simulations. So it would save time and money, ideally, uh, for experimentalists. Of course, there are others, uh, other goals. And uh, with these goals come some, ch some uh, challenges. And uh, one of the very important challenge I want to mention first is that models need to stay close to data. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting effort or, or exercise to create some mathematical models. Uh, it's very abstract, but the idea that we want uh, to, to, to perform or to, to achieve with these uh, models is to uh, stay close to reality. And for that, uh, models can be inferred from models, from, uh, sorry, from uh, data, or they can be used afterwards. Uh, the, the data can be used afterwards to parameterize the model, or it can be a mixture of both. But the importance uh, here is that we stay close to the data as much as possible. And of course, uh, models need to be predictive. Uh, the purpose is to suggest optimal single and combination of drug targets in the example I will give today. Um, but we want to do that also to optimize the efficacy of the drug, uh, both the dose and the frequency, some suggestion that we can make uh, to, to optimize this effect, and of course, minimize the side effects. Uh, ideally, we would propose a model per patient, and this comes with the idea of digital twin, uh, where we would have a, a, a digital version of the patient and we could test uh, the, the, the drugs before testing it in reality. I, I talk about personalized medicine. In fact, I like the, the, the word precision medicine better because it's not really, we're not going to really uh, um, provide some personalized uh, uh, medicine. What we are going to do is to, pro to find some target common features in group of, group of patients and uh, try to stratify these patients based on these common features. And we will treat groups of patients rather than individual patients. But since we are in the modeling world, we are allowed to think about uh, one model per patient. Personalized medicine is a form of medicine that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle for each person. And this is, um, this is uh, a definition from uh, NRC. What, uh, what do we hope for? Uh, we use, I mean, we work towards precision medicine on the long term to have uh, something like, uh, if, if you saw the movie Elysium, to have some kind of medical bed. And, and if you haven't seen this, uh, this movie, which I, I like a lot, you can, um, this is a scene, a very interesting scene where the mother has a, a sick child and she runs to this machine and uh, she, the, the, the girl uh, lays down on the bed and the, the machine scans uh, over her body, identify that she has acute uh, lymphoma, leukemia, and then uh, she scans again and it scans again, and then it clears the, the cancer cells. This is done for people that have enough money, of course, in the movie. But ideally, this, this is incredible. This would be uh, wonderful. It's non-invasive and uh, there's a treatment uh, right away, personalized. But of course, uh, as you can imagine, we're not there yet, and I'm not sure we want to be there uh, fast. <laughs> We have a lot of social, social problems to, to solve uh, beforehand. Anyway, this is another problem. <laughs> on, a, on a shorter term, what we can do is to, de to create these models as a support for treatment decision. And I, I want to take the example of uh, um, a clinical trial that was done in uh, Institut Curie, uh, which is called Shiva2. And uh, what, uh, what happened is that uh, the bioinformatics platform would get uh, the molecular profile from patients with different cancers, and then based on the molecular profile, some um, suggestion on of uh, targeted therapy was given to uh, to the, the the clinical board. Ideally, in 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 the in, in the next clinical trials, we would also do the same thing with a mathematical model, and then we would have an understanding of uh, mechanistically what happens uh, with these uh, targeted therapies and why it would work better or not on these patients. So this is this is the aim. 
what we are going to show you today with Arnaud is uh, two examples. The first one is a cancer study and the second one is a COVID-19 study. So I will start with the first one which is the search for optimal single and combined treatment for cancer patients. What we aim to do is to construct a network of cancer and then uh, translate this network into a model. What we understand by cancer systems biology is the study of how intra, both intra and extracellular perturbation of the healthy genome leads to tumorigenesis, and we do that using uh, formal methods. And uh, this, this is a, a nice picture because it gives a, a good idea of what, uh, what we start with. And this is a, a picture from uh, Anahan and Weinberg in uh, 2011, where uh, they show that you can actually understand the signaling pathways and uh, understand the interaction between genes in the form of, of a circuit. And you see that all these circuits interact. And if you have an alteration here, on PI3K, for instance, you could intervene here downstream, but you don't actually know what PI3K interfere with, and then um, it can have other uh, alterations. It, it gives you a way to summarize the information and, and provide some intelligent uh, ways of uh, suggesting interventions. Um, of course, still some challenges. Um, there are some challenges when you start modeling cancer. Patients with the same cancer uh, will respond differently to the same treatment because, in fact, uh, the, same cancer, the same type of cancer is very different from one patient to another. You have a high interpatient variation. And if you look at this molecular profile here, where you have a list of genes that are uh, very often mutated in breast cancer, you see that not one patient has exactly the same profile. So this is, this is important to keep in mind because the effect will be different. Also, a tumor is composed of multiple clones, and that may explain the relapse of, of some of the treatments. The clones are a, a group of mutations that are similar, and that will, uh, that will be more or less big in a tumor, and that will compose the whole tumor. Uh, and also, all these mutations have different impact on the cell fate. And I would say also, not just mutations, but combination of mutations will have a different impact on, on the cell fate. So you can lead to death, migration, division, and this is something you have to consider also and to study at the cellular level. And uh, the tumor interact with the microenvironment. It's not alone and it has to be taken into account as well. Of course, there are many other challenges. What, uh, what we aim to do is to use mathematical model to suggest personalized combination of drug treatments. And how do we do it? Uh, this is how we start. We formalize the knowledge into a network. Uh, here it's a regulatory network where you have uh, influences, positive and negative influence. It's signed and directed. And we translate this uh, type of networks uh, into a mathematical object. So here it's a differential equation, but it can be any type of formalism according to the question and the data that you have. You use the data to parameterize this model. So either find some, uh, either in the rules or also in the, in the parameter values. Then you simulate what is known. About, uh, about the system, and only then you can uh, formulate some uh, model prediction. There are, several, there are several works that have been done on this, and these are just uh, some examples related to our formalism, which is the Boolean formalism. So we chose this one for, for many reasons, because it's simple, it's versatile, and it's very well appropriate for what we had. But still, we had to modify slightly the formalism and adapt it to really include the data. So let me start first by explaining what uh, the formalism is about. As I mentioned, it's a, we start with a regulatory network, which is an, um, a direct and signed network, where each of the nodes here is associated to a variable that can take only two values, zero and one. And it will go from zero to one, depending on the status of its input. So let me give an example. Cycling B here will go from zero to one in the absence of CDC20 and in the absence of CDH1. And you do that for all of the nodes of the network. What you can do is you can associate a speed of reaction. So you can actually say how fast you go from zero to one with this transition rate. And this is a slight difference that we uh, included with MABOS, a tool that we published about, uh, that we built and published about 10 years ago now. And MABOS allows to give some continuous time in, in this discrete framework. Um, 
this is the solution space here each node is uh, actually a, a vector of all the nodes of the network and what we do is so we apply continuous time markov process onto this uh, network and then you will have several trajectories so each of these trajectory will allow to tell how often you actually uh, visit a node and that way you can assign some probabilities for each of these nodes and this is very handy because what you have at the end is one way to uh, follow these probabilities over time. And you can also quantify the effect of a perturbation. So here, this is the wild type here. If you mutate CDH1 here, so you cannot inhibit cyclin B anymore, then uh, you see that, um, that you change the phenotype and you change the probabilities for each of these phenotypes. So it's one way to quantify the solution and the impact of perturbation. We also developed a, a tool called Profile that uh, Arna will, uh, will describe a little more in detail, but I just want to give you a, a feeling of what it is. We can actually separate the data into, what, into discrete data and continuous data. So what we call discrete data are mutations and copy number alterations. And when we have discrete data, we force a value of a node to one or zero, depending on the effect of a mutation. So if we have CDH1 mutation, then we will force this value to one, and then it will always uh, be inhibiting cyclin B. When we have continuous data, we, we, we thought a lot about how to integrate that. And we decided that uh, we could understand that as uh, the higher the gene is, is expressed, the faster it can activate. And then we, uh, we change the, the, the transition rate accordingly. But again, Anna will explain a little more in detail. And then I come to the pipeline. So I gave a long introduction, but I wanted to give you an idea of, uh, of, of what the framework is about. And you, under, you, you see it's, it's a pretty simple uh, framework. We developed a pipeline to automatically compute drug combinations. So we started with different inputs. So public, we started with public cell line, <clears throat> sorry, data from uh, GDSC. So a database of, uh, of uh, cell line uh, information. And we started with logical models. The output of our pipeline is a list of single and combined drug, drug targets. You can imagine that when we, we really want to come to a, to a real uh, concrete problem, we run into issues and issues of computation and how uh, it can slow down the computation time. The number of nodes in the network, the more nodes you have in the network, you, you can expect that, that uh, the more complicated it will be to compute uh, the whole uh, state space. The number of cells also. So in our case, a trajectory, so wh what I show in the, in the state transition graph, can be considered as a cell. Are they interacting or not? Are they synchronized or not? And then also the number of treatment. If you do single mutation, but then double or triple mutation, sorry, inhibition, then uh, of course it, it uh, um, increases the, the comput computation time. So you, we need uh, optimized uh, codes and, and high performance computers. And you saw that and you were convinced with the, the previous seminars <coughs> from, um, from uh, Alfonso Valencia, Vincent Noel, Miguel Ponce Leon, and Pablo Rodriguez Mir. This is what the pipeline looks like. Uh, and I will walk you through it uh, pretty fast. We first uh, start with inputs. So the inputs can be list of genes that can be differentially expressed genes that can be drug targets or anything you want to include in the model. But we can also start with just uh, data. Uh, either With either uh, this type of inputs, you can uh, start with a list of genes and then you infer a network using a public database or you can infer a network using Carnival that you heard about in, uh, in previous seminars from Pablo. Once you have a network, we translate that into automatically into a mathematical model, into a Boolean model. So we transform into logical rules, the networks, and then we personalize the model using the, the uh, methodology I, I, I showed you in the previous slide. And when we have this personalized model, so we have one model per patient, then uh, we can perform uh, individual treatments, uh, in silico treatments, and suggest a list of single and combined treatments. Um, in details, you start with uh, different inputs, list of genes, or uh, the model that is the network that is extracted from the data with Carnival. We automatically translate that into a, a Boolean model in MAPBOS format, or what you can do also is take any model that is already published in SBML format, and then, so in a standard format, 
and then uh, you will have a Mabos model right away. Then we personalize the, the Boolean model. Uh, again, this is something I already showed you and you, you'll see a little more later. What you have to see here is you have one model per cell line. And then we perform the, the, the drug uh, treatment. I, I took an example here of a model we published a while ago. It's a, a model of cell migration. And I took an example of three cell lines from DGSC. This network is, a, is, a, is translated into a mathematical model. We run the pipeline. And at the end, what I get is this table here with CASP3 is a, a marker for uh, apoptosis. So the higher you activate CASP3, you can imagine that the higher the effect of the treatment. And then we see the probability for each of these combination to activate CASP3. What we understand here uh, is that the optimal treatment for these three, three cell lines are these two one, MIR200, associated to the inhibition of uh, uh, MAPK1. Uh, this is done on, on three cell lines. You see some slight changes between, uh, slight differences between the cell lines, but you can imagine you can do that on the whole uh, data set and then some prioritize uh, the, the best treatment for uh, the majority of the, of the patient. On the, we, we looked at the performance on HPC. You can see actually here the graph dependency on four cell lines, and you can see that all the tasks are uh, pretty well parallelized and optimized to fasten the process. If we look at the execution trace, on uh, we tested the seven two cell lines on Marinostrum, and you see that it's very well parallelized. We have one simulation per uh, node. And, uh, so this is this is the first example, and then the question you may ask. So this is very interesting. We look at one uh, one cell cell uh, or one uh, one tumor, but actually, uh, what about simulating a dynamic population of interact interacting cells? I simulated here the tumor cell, but there are many other cell types that uh, have to be considered. And I will give the floor to Arnaud. Hi, Arnaud here. So yes, nice transition. Um, let me just share the screen. So I hope the background noise is okay. Also, we close the window. Um, okay. So do you see a slide now? Yes. Okay, great. So um, yeah, I'll be talking today about um, about the use case of uh, where we have used the multi-scale modeling in COVID. So first, uh, very briefly, I want I want to explain what tool have we used and and, and and on which tool we have based and and we have worked. So this tool is called Physicel, which is an agent an agent based uh, that is flexible and, and allows for other add-ons and allows for many many personalizations. Let me just yes here. So um, the idea of agent based modeling is that you you have numerous agents and then you have some kind of decision making heuristics. And you have some interaction topology between the things that are in the environment and the different agents. And then you have an explicit description of the environment. So this is important. I mean, you don't have a field. What you have is specific, uh, you voxelize the, the, the environment and you can, you can ask or you can query what is the, I don't know, the level of virus near the cell and then the cell can, can counteract this, et cetera. So each one of the cell agents have some, some properties that you have some volume, position, et cetera. You also have some internal states and then the domain or the, Let's say the three-dimensional environment where, this, where these agents are, they can be stated like in 3D shapes or like, like the spheroid, or you can also have like petri dishes, epithelia, biofilms, etc. So if you want to know more about this physical tool, there is a very nice work by Gafarzide Gafarizade et al. in 2018. And also we have built from several years now, we have built uh, with uh, we have built a tool called Physiboss on top of this physical. Uh, that currently we have a preprint in BioArchive that you can also, also look and you can, you can learn more about it. So uh, the idea was to use these multi-scale modeling in order to study lung epithelium and, and COVID infection. So um, we started this project building on top of other projects, that is as it happens a lot in, in science. So the first project we built upon was this SARS-CoV-2 tissue simulator by the developers or headed by the developers of Physicel, Paul Macklin from Indiana University. Uh, that they aim to represent SARS-CoV-2 infections. So they had uh, the virus uh, infecting epithelial cells, and then they have a host of other cells, such as dendritic cells, neutrophils, macrophages, and also the different kinds of T cells, the CD4, CD8, etc. And uh, this is a very, very nice uh, phenomenological model in which 
in which they when when something is present or where, where something reaches a given level of, of, of threshold it affects other things in the in the in, in the other cells or, or or in the environment but the problem is that we thought that it lacked mechanistic detail so our idea was to introduce physibos inside inside this inside this model in order to add this stochastic modeling on, on top of, of this agent based so um, the physics cell for covid uh, repository you can you can access here and then they have a preprint um that is that is in bioarchive i think they have already five versions of this of this preprint incremental versions of complexity of, of the model uh, that you can that you can use and that you can you can study on your own and the second project that we built upon or that we we like drain resources from in order to to have this use case was the disease map covid19 uh, community so this, uh, there is already a paper published here in which they would present these this maps in which uh, we, we gather the effort of a, of a whole community in order to represent mechanistically what happens in different kinds of cells or in we in different kind of different levels of the epithelial cells whenever uh, SARS-CoV-2 infects this epithelial cell. So um, these, these are mechanistic maps and these were manually created. So we built some, others built, others built other models, et cetera. And then you have all of them in SBML. You can have access them with, with this link. And uh, our idea was to, to take two of, uh, to start with a few of, of these models, namely epithelial model and a macrophage model. So we took a Boolean model of each and we introduced these, these mechanistic models inside this uh, physics cell for uh, COVID-19 initiative. So, I mean, as you can imagine, I mean, this community effort were, were much, much, much bigger than, 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 our, than our team or than, or than QD and, and, and BSC. It was a whole trove of people just working together in order to build this kind of model that you have here on the left. So this is the epithelial cell model, which kind of like want to depict mechanistically what happens when SARS-CoV-2 uh, infects epithelial cell and how this affects apoptosis. So the idea is that uh, with the virus presence and the T cell attached, you have different kinds of apoptosis, uh, apoptosis in the epithelial cells. And then the second model that we wanted to work with was this macrophages model, in which there is an immune cell recruitment by macrophages and how SARS-CoV-2 can, can alter these, these recruitment by, by macrophages. So uh, we, we identify inputs and outputs of each one of the models in order to incorporate them into the, into the agent base. Uh, and uh, for this, what we first needed to do was to personalize these, these Boolean models. So each one of those epithelial cells, we didn't want to study just a naive epithelial cell or a, or a generic macrophage uh, model, but we wanted to study specific uh, um, patients, epithelials and patients macrophages. So in order to do this, we took on this profile, uh, profile paper that we published uh, some years ago in which the idea is to take different, different omics data, copy number alterations, mutations, or expression data, and a given uh, Boolean model in order to personalize this, uh, this Boolean model. So the idea is that you have some kind of generic logical model and you have uh, some, some the omics data sets, and then you merge those two and you constrain the model with the different patient profiles. And you do this by altering the node activity status, the initial state, and the transition rate. And at the end, what you want is a collection of different of different models that are slightly different, depending on the patient data that that has constrained that you have constrained this model. And then uh, we want to have, of course, a clinical validation and ideally a drug a drug prediction. <clears throat> so briefly, uh, the three different levels that we that we can alter are the different node states. So this we would use mutant data, or we would assimilate mutant data on this, initial conditions. So let's say the growth media conditions or the different experimental setup, or also the transition rates. So that, that, we, um, that we consider there is the gene's ability to activate or deactivate. So as, as Laurence present, uh, has presented before this uh, Boolean state transition graph, what we want with, for instance, with the transition rate is to alter how easy or how hard it is for uh, gene A to go from one to zero or for, for gene B to go from zero to one. Okay, so maybe all, all the patients have the same, exactly the same activation patterns. So always that you have gene B will inhibit gene A, but maybe the way it inhibits is different from patient one to patient two. And uh, for data types that we, that we consider are namely copy number alterations and then also expression data. So in this particular case in the COVID, we will not consider mutations or copy number alteration, but only RNA expression data. So you have more details on this on, on this paper from 2019. And an example of what we have done already with this profile is that we use this on breast cancer in the original paper uh, on, from 2018. And recently we used it also for our, an approached model in which we personalize this model for 
So almost 500 TCGA patients and eight different prostate cancer cells. And we, we, we see that there is a different, depending on the, on the patient vision score, you see a different profile in terms of proliferation and apoptosis of these, of these models. So going back to, to COVID, what we did is that we took one of the first uh, single cell RNA seq data sets that were published in, uh, uh, I think it was April 2020, that was this bronchoalveolar lavage fluid from different patients. And uh, we, we see, for instance, here there, there are two patients, one mild and one severe. And we took the values or the, the, the data sets for specifically the macrophage cells and the epithelial cells. So this single cell RNA set, you have one data point per each cell of this, of this lavage fluid. And, and you can see first that there is a huge difference between, between counts. I mean, in some you have on the hundreds and in others you have on the thousands. And this also alters the, the result, but it is, it is what we have. And then of course, between macrophages and epithelial cells also here you have difference in, in terms of counts. But we wanted to focus on these two because we had the Boolean models for these two. Then the, the, the following thing that we did was to just analyze a sort of pipeline, which is a quite, uh, uh, let's say, standard uh, pipeline, or one of the standard pipelines in order to, uh, to analyze single cell RNA seq, uh, in order to get the mean of the single cells. So from all the single cells for macrophages, what we wanted was the, the mean of these, of, these, uh, of these values. And the same for the epithelium. In the sense, you cover one of the, one of the drawbacks of this single cell RNA seq, which is that you have many unknowns. There are many genes that you have zero value. You don't know if, if it's because it's a technical zero that the machine didn't capture it, or if it's a real zero value that the, the patient didn't have this expression on this on this gene. So, and then once we had these uh, these uh, subtype specific single cell RNA seq, what we did is that we we built these subtype profiles in order to uh, constrain these different initial states and transition uh, rates in order to have uh, a different epithelial model for the different and macrophages model for the different patients. So one of the things that we did, for instance, was to study the models in which we saw that there are different knockouts in the epithelial model that blocked the commitment to apoptosis. So in, for instance, if you block fat uh, knockout in all the patients, you will have a reduction in apoptosis. And in the macrophages model, we saw that there are some uh, knockouts that enhance immune cell recruitment. So for instance, in all the, in all the patients, you see that if you have the knockout on the P38, you'll have 10% more cell recruitment than, the, than, than if you don't. So what, what we first did is we, we studied the, let's say the, the intracellular model using MABOS, the intracellular model of, of the different patients. And we saw that we saw uh, different, uh, different probabilities. So here, what, what we're comparing is again, the mild patient and the, and the severe patient. And then we introduced these intracellular models inside this physicel cell for, uh, for COVID that we call PhysiBOS uh, for COVID. And here we study the different dynamics of the different patients. And we can we can build, uh, I mean, the authors of the physical for COVID already established a very easy way in order to build these GIFs, uh, where, where you see how, how the different populations of cells are, are, uh, are, are responding differently to the different virus. So here in the GIFs, is, it's quite beautiful, but it's, it's hard to interpret, uh, let's say quantitatively. So in order to have, to have this interpretation, what we do is that we study dynamics. So here on the left, you have the mild patient, and on the right, you have the severe patient, and you see that you have more or less the same dynamic, but with some differences. So for instance, the alive, the live cells drop in the mild and in the severe, you, you see more, uh, more infected, more infected cells. Um, and then also you can do exactly the same things for uh, the, the, the immune cells. So you can have the different levels of, of macrophages, neutrophils, and, and, and CD8 uh, T cells uh, in, in, in the different patients. And you see that it's a similar immune response, but on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the severe patient, you see that you have fewer macrophages on the days four to six, and you have fewer CD8, CD8 T cells. So of course, if you extend this, this time in simulation, you will see that, that the red will eventually go up, but it starts later to go up in comparison with the mild patient. So this allows us to have some, some, different, some different, uh, um, yeah, so different heterogeneity across across patients. So then the next you know, the next the next question was okay. I mean, imagine that we don't have ten patients like in this data set, but we have thousands of patients. How how can we compartmentalize these different building blocks or these these tasks in order to have workflows that we can that we can scale up in complexity and we can scale up as well in in terms of number of number of patients. So we we will build this uh, physical COVID uh, workflow in which we have. We have encapsulated each one of these tools into different building blocks. And now we can combine these building blocks uh, in, order, in order to make different workflows. And also we can scale up the number of patients. So 
the, the, the main motivation to use workflows is basically an economy an economy of scale. So we want to uh, we want to be able to scale up in number of simulations to have many more runs, to have replicates for the patients, to have thousands of patients, etc. And we also want to use large large data set, and we also want to use different mutations on each patient. So this this uh, uh, gives you the, the the problem, or let's say the, the the blessed problem that you have many work to do. And in order to do this, we, what we want to do is to use a supercomputer like Mare Nostrum or like the other supercomputer in June. And this also, uh, I mean, solving this problem, you also solve other problems such as reproducibility, replicability, and reuse. If you offer the community a workflow that the community can can use in their in their own in their own clusters and in their own computers, they will be able to study this reproducibility of your workflow. It's not just this uh, script in my computer, but it's this workflow in this closed environment that I give to you, so that you can you can test it in your own in your own uh, uh, cluster. So. Having this workflow, we, we studied two different scales of, 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 this, of this work. One is the weak scaling, which is when you increase the work and you increase the workers. So this study how, how the different workflows communicate among them. And we saw that we tested this uh, from one patient to 10 patients and from one node to 10 nodes. Okay, so here in, in node number one, you're studying one patient. In node number two, you're simulating two patients and so on and so forth. And we did this for several mutations in wild type and also in different replicates. And we saw that that the, the different building blocks that were basically analyzing each one of the patients were more or less constant. But there is one building block that we call meta-analysis that it just gathers all the results and does some, uh, let's say, some cluster analysis of all those results. And this meta-analysis grows big, as big as the number of, of, of patients, because it has to wait for the slower patient to finish, and then it has to gather the results, and then it has to analyze its stuff. So uh, we, we realized this by uh, doing this weak scaling performance in, uh, with, with, uh, with all the workflow and also removing this meta-analysis. And you realize that when, when you remove the meta-analysis, you're very, very close to the ideal, to the ideal efficiency. So what we're doing now is to work with this meta-analysis, changing this meta-analysis uh, building block in order to have something that can be parallelized and you don't have to wait for the slowest uh, patient uh, in the simulation. And the other is uh, the strong scaling, which means that you fix the work. So now we're always simulating 100 patients and you increase the number of workers. So now uh, from in one node here, you're simulating 100 patients in one node. And in this, in this point here, you're simulating 100 patients using 100 nodes. And then, well, again, we, we saw also the mean time per, per, per the different functions across patients and replicates. And we saw that at first, again, the meta-analysis had some varying uh, time depending on the different nodes. This is across replicates as well, so so we don't think that this is stochastic, but it's just uh, it's just that something is happening in the communications of these of these three nodes here or in the others. And again, I mean this this allows you to focus on let's say the the, the, the building blocks that are dragging your your simulation in order to have this economy of scale of of patients. So all in all, uh, the I hope that that Laurence and myself have convinced you of that the models and simulation are useful in order to. If the browse the different possibilities that you have in a given in a given bio, biomedical or biotechnological problem before going to the bench and also to to allow you to study the limitations on the different constraints that you have in your biological knowledge hopefully this this is a step forward having digital twins uh, for patients uh, i hope that we have this elysian medical bench but we don't have the, the ethical problems that they had in the movie and that that end up quite uh, well it's a, it's a very very uh, nice allegory of what would happen in the in the far future. Uh, also, uh, I hope that we have that we have convinced you that, that you can simulate optimal combined treatments in different cancer, cancer patients. And what we're doing now, what, what, what Laurence and, 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 and Pablo are doing now is to expand the different machine learning methods in order to build models from, uh, from a given data set. Uh, also, I hope that I have convinced you that, that we can have simulations of mechanistical simulations of COVID patients. And in order to infer different potential interventions, and now what we're doing right now is to include other models so from the other from the other immune cells, and also perform longer longer simulations and have a bit more complex setup. So what you see in this in this GIF was a patch of a two D epithelium, and we would like to have like a three D uh, um, setup in which you would have the virus entering from one of the one of the extremes, and then it would it would uh, you would have uh, blood uh, blood vessels in the surroundings, etc. And then also that uh, that by using this flexible and scalable workflow library, we could we could like easy the work for future projects, 
in which we could expand the different building blocks for other use case and other and other uh, tools. So yes, as Laurent said before, so Laurence and myself are presenting are presenting this this talk, but this has been the work of many more other people that that, that were not presenting today, but could have presented perfectly the, the work, such as Pablo and Julio for for Heidelberg, and also and San Marco from Curie and Jose and Javier from uh, from BS. So uh, all in all, thank you very much for for your attention, and I think we can uh, we can uh, take the questions uh, now. Maybe I will start sharing. Yes. Okay. Thank thank you both for a really clear presentation about uh, what it's been done and all the uh, possibilities for the future, including some that are on the edge of what we would consider science fiction, but yeah. We nerd out with the computers. Um, so we have a few questions already. So I can take them uh, in the order they arrive. But uh, remember, everyone, you can use the Q and A button in your in your Zoom panel to ask questions. So the first one says, um, well, they they ask at that point. But perhaps you will you will cover that later in the presentation. But how do you see the output of the pipeline for drug combinations being tested or otherwise going to the clinic? What needs to what needs done to implement this in human health? So, so maybe I can start, Anna. Um, I mean, most of the work that uh, that I've done so far has been with Anna, so he can he can answer us the work as much as me. But we we ask ourselves the question actually, uh, especially before we were working on HPC, we we try to see um, uh, how we could. Uh, uh, op optimize the work and 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 go to the clinic and in fact when we started the uh, first analysis that we did we we, we filtered our list of uh, targets to uh, drugs that already existed so that's one thing uh, so going to the clinic is already uh, knowing what is feasible and and not go to the the idea of of, uh, of searching for new new uh, new new drugs so that's one point and there's a, a question that uh, comes in uh, i read the, the two other questions about um about how we go to the clinic afterwards you know what uh, the analysis is is interesting but then what's the next step and in fact uh, i see that as a very first step and, and, and a suggestion of, of possible drugs. But then there's a, a very long analysis to do on the dosage because our, our uh, formalism is not giving ideas on, on dosage or frequency. Uh, or frequency it can actually, but dosage is, is really relative. Our outputs are very relative. Um, so it, it's really the first step. We, we, we restrict the, the, the domains of possibles. And then, of course, there are other uh, important, very important steps uh, towards uh, the clinics. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, very humble. <laughs> it's the first, uh, very first step. Um, I hope it answered the question. Okay, thank you. I mean, yeah, if, there's, if the participant has any follow-up questions, I'm sure they can, yeah. or if they, have any, any clarif they need any clarifications, they can add it. Um, we have another question afterwards. Um, well, it was addressed to Laurence, but as you mentioned, uh, you have done much of the work together. So thank you very much indeed for the inspiring and interesting presentation. You mentioned that patients with the same cancer will respond differently to the same treatment. As a result, maybe the personalized human digital twin could be the ideal solution or support in order to, person to personalize medicine. Do you agree or do you think that you need a different support? Um, in general, what, what do you need in terms of financial, technological, infrastructure support in order to better achieve your own uh, research? Thank you in advance. I'm yeah, I, I, I think we are trying to get towards a digital twin. What uh, our approach is, uh, is, I wouldn't say we do uh, the digital twin. Uh, we lack a lot of parameters and, and I'm thinking a lot about a lot of... Uh, uh, physical parameters. Uh, we need to to see the effects at the at the level of the organ, uh, at the level of the. the we, we also need to take into account uh, the pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetic kinetics um, uh, part of the of the analysis. So again, this is the first step towards the digital twin. Uh, this I think this is the way to go. I think uh, this is uh, this is really important, and and I hope that it can be can be used at some point uh, as a as a support. I, I mentioned it in in my first slide. It's a, a support for for clinical decisions, and maybe now you you want to complete. 
on this. No, 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 no. I, I, I agree, I agree. I mean, in a sense, we're not doing translational, translational research. Yeah. What we're doing is, uh, let's say, we're giving, we're shedding light on cellular biology or, or on cancer biology, uh, but but I think we're far from from work. I mean, I, I I would like to be to be as close as possible to to the clinical bed, but but we're not there. And we're uh, not quantitative. Also, I, I I'm insisting we're not quantitative. We need uh, more precise uh, models and and access to a lot of uh, of data that we don't have access to. Yeah, but but also maybe it's because the data is is not there. I mean, maybe it's in a vault in, in some company, but may, maybe it's not. I mean, I'm pretty sure that there are lots of biophysical parameters that, that people don't know. So, yeah, actually, maybe that's also the part of um, in this question. The, the last part was, what do you need in terms of financial, technological, infrastructural support? Maybe also there's the need for more data maybe that maybe it exists or maybe doesn't exist yet, but it's it's needed. And HPC also. I mean, we need uh, we need to be able. Imagine we have the models, we have the data, and everything is okay. Uh, if if we want the clinicians to push a button, uh, imagine all the computation. So we need we need uh, technical support definitely, and and optimized codes to pro, to to uh, to allow that. And this is what we're trying to do in the in the project. Perfect. Um... Okay, um, there is another question. Uh, thank you for the meaningful insight. Uh, well, this is this we can ask separately. First question is, what kind of future research do you think is crucial to be able to deliver this for clinical use? What skills or resources are needed? We go back to the resources, but maybe also about the skills. Um... This, well, we, we addressed some of the, uh, one part of the question uh, already uh, for the skills. Um, I think we build this pipeline so that we don't have to have too many skills. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we, we don't. So I'm a modeler. I'm not sure I want people to, to construct models. I want uh, the models I build to be reused. And I don't need people to know exactly what's in there if they don't want to. So uh, yeah, the, the, the idea is to put a lot of, uh, of skills together to facilitate and, uh, and, and make simple the simulation of, of this type of analysis. Yeah, if, if I may, in terms of, in terms of skill, I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, interface area, let's say. I mean, uh, I think it interfaces mathematics, computer science, and biology. And, and in that sense, you can come to the area from different from different fields. And then, I mean, depending on the fields where you come, I mean, you know what, what you don't know, let's say. Uh, but in that sense, I think uh, the, the, that, that area is very enriched by, by the different people that can come from different uh, from different places. So, so in the skills, I mean, you, you have to know that you will not have 100% of the skills when, when you enter the, 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 the BS area of research, which, which is okay. I mean, at least you, you know that, that what you don't know. So at least it gives you it gives you a focus or where you, where you need what you need to learn in order to in order to arrive to this. And the, I'm I'm also going to add to this uh, question that training the training program of Permit CO is aiming to cover uh, those skills knowledge that that is needed. At the webinar for the last webinar from from uh, ten days ago was actually about the competency framework that we have developed in Permit Theory to know what are the competencies that uh, professionals will need in the future in the field of computational medicine. So uh, I encourage uh, everyone to, to go to our website to see the recording of that uh, session and the rest, of course, but especially about this part of the skills. Um, there was another question by the same participant. Um, when you created the model, it was developed to be able to represent the data. How did you avoid overfitting so that it will be useful to analyze different data input? Um, so I think you mentioned the first steps of the pipeline. Um, so, so some of the models that are published are, are pretty generic. So they are not built from the data and the, the parameterization comes afterwards. But for the, the parts that is inferred from the data, so going from, car to, from Carnival, um, so I wouldn't say it's overfitting, actually. We are lacking some data. It's, uh, I would say it's underfit, in fact. 
because our our methodology we have no way to to validate it we hope that this is the, going in the right track but we have no way to to validate the profiler uh, methodologies is difficult to to validate so i wouldn't say it's overfitting and um the idea that um that we when we create the network is to redo it every time so depending it's really related to the data so it's done automatically from the data so uh, you would have a model per data set i hope i'm answering the question now do you want to add anything or now or so we go okay um okay so before we had the question it was more aimed to Lawrence about the kind of support or resources needed now it was specifically asked to you are now uh thank you for the extremely interesting talk what kind of specific support do you think uh, is missing in eu in your uh, research field so in in it's a tricky question in the sense that that um so as I say, I mean, we're in this interface of different areas. So the, there is always the problem of, for instance, talking about EU funding or where, I mean, where to send your, 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 your uh, what, what panel to choose, let's say. So if uh, you can lean on the HPC or the computer science, you can lean on the biology or you can lean on the maths. And sometimes it's complicated to have these, let's say, intersectional panels where, where you know that at least there will be one person for each field that, that that will understand the motivation and that will understand the limitations of, of what, you, what you're presenting. Uh, because else, I mean, if, if you present uh, this, this, exactly the same webinar, you present it to, to, let's say, a pure biologist conference or to a pure mathematical conference, I mean, they will they will understand part of it, they will not understand the other part, and then they will not understand, why, I mean, why, why the limitations of this Boolean model, right? I mean, why only a model of 100 nodes and not 100,000 models? And he's like, well, you know, because we build it by hand. What do you mean by hand? So in that sense, I mean, you see that there are there are quite quite uh, um, let's say that you have to walk this distance between between those those different those different fields and the same happened for for HPC I mean for instance in this case we have used hundred nodes and then the question can can be okay but but why don't you have a problem so big that you need the whole Mare Nostrum uh, to have these simulations like well because maybe we don't have that many patients and and the simulations are not that long in order to or don't parallelize that well so um, in that sense I mean I mean the interface is very interesting but of course I mean you lack, you lack like like these different. You don't have a, a proper, let's say, a mature audience. Let's say in that sense, which is which is okay. I mean, I mean, it's it's something that is a characteristic of the field right now. I mean, it's not it's not a problem, but it can it can lead to to different to different problems. It's definitely a, a challenge to bring together those different sectors that uh, that the knowledge and their expertise is, is different, and sometimes they speak uh, different vocabulary, let's say, but I think we are making progress there. Thank you for those answers. Um, so another couple of questions, also uh, participants saying thank you for the very nice presentation. Um, when calculating the transition probabilities from the data, does this mean that non-detectable gene targets are pruned from the directed network? Uh so I'll answer. Um, so they can be, so we create a, a model per network. So they can be prone for uh, some uh, patients and not for others. Uh, if they are completely non-detectable in the whole population, yes, they will be, uh, they, they will be, uh, um, they will be zero. They will never, or, ve or very, very slow uh, probability to be activated. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, then there was a second question from this participant. What is the current upper limit for the number of patients cell lines that can be paralyzed? How long does it take to compute one? So maybe I can start with the pipeline. Um, so actually, we don't have upper limits for nodes. And, and this, so this is a good question. Uh, the, the simulation with my boss is actually pretty fast. Uh, and indeed, uh, the number of patients is the limiting factor. Um, so we tested uh, what I showed, uh, the 72 cell lines uh, took about 20 minutes on uh, Marie Nostrum, on 72 uh, uh, cores, nodes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and for, for COVID, uh, it, it's a matter of, of available data sets and of, of doing the, let's say, the, the manual work in order to have these these data sets inside uh, inside the framework, uh, but I mean each simulation that I showed here it was something like seven minutes of of uh, total time, um, 
Now, again, I mean, one, one of the things that we want to do is to have longer simulations. So of course, this will take this will take much more time. But in terms of parallelizing this, I mean, uh, we can use uh, we can use as many as many data sets as we can, as we can. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have a couple more questions. Let's see. If we have time to uh, answer them just before and to be sure we don't run out of time. I'm already going to uh, just let participants know. Can you see my screen? Yes. So I just want everyone to uh, to know that uh, we will now have a summer break and we will be back in year two of the webinar series starting in October with uh, the one about data protection and security aspects when running simulations uh, or with HPC. So you can already go to our website, see the recordings of the previous webinars and sign up for upcoming webinars. And also I want people just to know about two courses. One is uh, this is the first announcement that we are planning to run a permit seal in summer school uh, next year. More information coming soon. So also check our channels uh, because we will announce it there. And uh, for many of you that might be interested in all these topics at the moment, there is a, a course that it's open that might be interesting uh, for you. So while I leave that information there, uh, Lawrence, and now I just uh, try to go through the last two questions. Um, so one is, if I understood it correctly, and please correct me if I did not, uh, the model knows the state active and inactive for one pathway component. What mm -hmm. kind of data do you use for this determination and how do you find the proper threshold? So this, this is a, a very good question. So we, 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 we uh, suggest, uh, we propose a, a methodology in profile and uh, the threshold um, actually for the, the continuous data, we normalize the data and we don't discretize the data. So it's not just one or zero, it's the probability to be one or the probability to be zero. So it's, it's a, a little different. And uh, what kind of data do we use? We use, uh, so mutation copy number and RNSEC data, but we would love to include in our analysis some epigenetic uh, also data. Uh, and this, this has to be thought, you know, how do you, uh, on top of the active, on top of the, the the data that we have, knowing that if we have protein data and RNSEC data, sometimes it's not the same. So which one do we use? Uh, do we overwrite the protein data on top of the RNSEC data, which we use as a proxy for the activity activity of the protein? So these are uh, things that we um, that we have to consider and and to include. So the proper threshold, uh, it's it's really dependent on uh, on the data that you that you have. And it's not completely uh, uh, defining a threshold. Okay. And we have Thank several you. rules for that. But I, I invite you to to have a look at the paper and contact uh, Anna or me if you have some questions about it. Perfect. Thanks for that. And then we have one last question that are now uh, has already answered in the chat. I'm just going to read it out loud for the, for the recording purposes. So, um, since personalized medicine includes patient lifestyle, how are lifestyle factors incorporated into your models? And just to answer, it's hard to introduce lifestyle variables in a mechanistic model. We need to know the effect and ideally the mechanism to do something useful with it. And yes. if I can co complete on this, uh, we try the other way around. We try to use our data, our uh, probability and include that into clinical models. Uh, to include that as parameters of, a, of a, a clinical models. And it, it's not very successful. Uh, so far, <laughs> but uh, I'm not going to continue on this aspect, but this is a possibility to include the probability of the of, of some uh, uh, outputs of the models into models that include several, um, several uh, aspects like lifestyle. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are reaching the hour. So Thank you. It was a great presentation. Uh, I think you can see we can see by the questions and the comments that uh, it was people really liked it. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, Laurence. Thank you now for uh, uh, coming today and dedicating some time. Thank you. So, okay. So thank you all.